Hello everybody and welcome back to the Kansas City Zoo. My name is Ashley, with me I have John, and we are continuing on with our exploration into classification. So this is actually part two of our classification series. If you have not watched part one, I would encourage you to go back and watch that video before proceeding on with this one. So as a recap of where we left off with classification, classification is a scientific tool scientists use to sort and group animals based off of common characteristics. Our taxonomy levels for classification are as follows. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, as species. You start off large and as you go further and further down our levels, you get to be a little bit more specific. Our second classification tool we covered is the idea of a phylogenetic tree to kind of map out your different phylum and all of your characteristics. So as a recap, to read a phylogenetic tree, all of these hash marks are our shared uh, characteristics. So down here at the bottom, we had movement and consumer, which then became true for any animal discussed further along up our phylogenetic tree. And any characteristic written on a specific branch is just true for that particular phylum. So where we left off is we got all the way up to our level of chordata here and the idea of an endoskeleton. I think this is the part in classification where people kind of start to perk up because as we continue to add more characteristics, we get into our more complex animals and therefore the animals that become a little bit more familiar to us. So an endoskeleton is again a skeleton that is on the inside of the body. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna break down chordata. So our kingdom is Animalia, our phylum is Chordata. So if we move down one more level of classification, we're actually gonna talk about classes. So we're gonna flip our board here and we're gonna show our new phylogenetic tree here. So our first class, because remember we're moving down a level, our first class we're gonna talk about is Amphibia. Yes. And that should sound a little familiar. Hopefully. Now you might also notice before we even get to amphibia, mm -hmm. we do have one characteristic on the tree. And that is moving forward, everything in chordata is what is called a tetrapod. And so that means it has four limbs of some kind. It might have four legs, might have you know arms and legs mm -hmm. like us, whatever, there's four of them. So back to amphibia. We did bring another animal friend with us today. I have a Vietnamese mossy frog, amphibia, or as we call them, amphibians. Same thing, frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, all those things. So those characteristics that you're gonna find in amphibia, they're gonna have that nice slimy skin. It's kind of like a membrane, helps them to breathe, absorb things through the water, all kinds of stuff. But then also, when they lay eggs, their eggs look a little bit different from say like the chicken eggs that you or I might find in the grocery store. They have kind of a jelly-like egg. That jelly egg does have kind of a covering on it, a membrane, but it does help those eggs to absorb things through the water, get those nutrients, stay hydrated, all very, very important. Uh, after that, we're going to move on to what should be the most familiar <laughs> for all of us, mammalia or mammals. So when you think of a mammal, the things you might think of are hair. We have hair. Uh, some animals we call it fur, like our chimpanzees behind us here. Um, we are endothermic. It's a new term for us, but if you think about back to when we talked about exoskeletons and endoskeletons, an endotherm, you might also know it as warm-blooded. We make our own body temperature. We regulate our own body temperature. So it stays pretty much the same unless we're sick, then it can elevate and it can kind of self-regulate. We'll talk about ectotherms later or an ectothermic animal like our amphibians, but also some others later. Uh, ectotherms, also known as cold-blooded, they more rely on the temperature changing around them. They can't regulate themselves. They have to find some kind of an outside source. So it might be a sun, the sun, it might be a hot rock. I know sometimes in the summertime you see things like reptiles or snakes out on the asphalt sitting out in the sun. Now the last big thing about mammals is when they have babies, we feed our babies milk. Pretty much covers mammals. Those are the mm -hmm. three big ones at least for mammals. There's tons yep. of little bitty ones too. 
Now the reason why classification get, can cut complicated rather quickly is because there's always those rules breakers, always right? Always exceptions. So while we're talking about just very basics and general ideas about classification, just know that there is always an animal that is going to break the rules. So for mammals, John mentioned milk, mm -hmm. but the one reason why we're not gonna put live birth down on there is because not all mammals actually experience mm -hmm. live birth. So animals such as the platypus or echidna, they actually lay eggs. Yes. But since they satisfy all of these other characteristics, we're still gonna classify them under the class of mammals. Yep. So moving on to our last couple branches here, we have reptiles. Yes, reptiles, or we also call that reptilia. Mm-hmm. Now, Ashley, mm -hmm. before we get too far into reptilia, I have a question for yes. you. So originally we said tetrapods, they have to have four limbs. Mm -hmm. But I know, and I know you know, a snake is a reptile. Yes. What's up with that? So sometimes there is something within classification that we call a derived loss. And what that means is somewhere along the line, animals figured it was more beneficial to not have certain characteristics. Okay. So snakes are still related to tetrapods, but they have along the way lost their limbs. But okay. they're still classified as a reptile. If you look at their bony structure, we still see evidence that at one point they did have limbs. Got it. But and then the other big thing about mm -hmm. reptiles is they are covered in scales. The big difference with them between, I know we say fish have scales too, reptiles tend to have dry scales. A lot of times we think they might be slimy or things like that. Snakes and reptiles, they do like to go in the water, so a lot of times that's just the water coming off of them. Other times they're kind of waxy. Mm -hmm. Just depends on if they're shedding, things like that. Then our last couple, mm -hmm. it gets kind of tricky here. Uh, our next couple characteristics would be, uh, I believe feathers mm -hmm. is one. And what was our other one? I believe they're endothermic. The endothermic, again. right, the endothermic again. So I think you know it, I think I know it. It'd be birds. Birds, we also call them aves, is the is the class that we're talking about. Uh, if you also notice though, we have some kind of weird disconnect that these guys, amphibians, are ectothermic. Reptiles are ectothermic, but then we have our warm-blooded friends that kind of jumps around a little bit because they actually both kind of develop that characteristic independent of each other. So it's not true of that whole phylum. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So that was sort of classes in a nutshell. We chose the classes that are a little bit more familiar to us and maybe to you as well. So just know that there are many more and more classes. Usually the ones that start down here are a lot of the fish yep. um, and things again found in the ocean. But we hope this gives you an idea, again, of how incredibly useful classification is for the use of science and breaking down the animal kingdom. Especially because the scientists are finding new species every day. Mm -hmm. And so when they're trying to classify those species, they will refer back to some of this phylogenetics and see mm -hmm. what shared characteristics they have with animals that we already know about mm -hmm. to try to figure out where they fit in the whole big picture of everything. Yeah, and even as we learn more, sometimes our phylogenetic trees change. even change. Yep. So, we're gonna challenge some of our students out there a little as well, because what we've done is we've created a lesson plan to go along with our classification lesson that we've done here for today. So as a reminder, there is two parts to our classification exploration. There's a part one and a part two. If able, make sure you watch both of them. And then if you are a teacher or a student, look into our lesson plan on the Kansas City Zoo website and it'll kind of go more in depth into classification and ask questions on how to read the phylogenetic tree to make sure you get a full understanding of how it works. Yep. But for now, I think we're gonna say goodbye till next time. This is John, that's Ashley. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.